we're basically uh, <coughs> picking up where we left off where we were talking about uh, the Trinity versus Adventism, right? That was what we left off at part one. Yeah. And we looked at, uh, at these seven pillars. We examined three of them and we saw basically, in short, that the that the Trinity is incompatible with the Ten Commandments, with the honor of the Ten Commandments, and obviously, of course, therefore, the Sabbath and what the Sabbath means and signifies. And uh, we spent a bit of time looking at uh, the state of the dead, particularly how that relates to the death of Christ. So we want to continue our examination and looking at the other four that we have this evening. And the next one, of course, is the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages we know is recorded in Revelation 14. Uh, seven, uh, starting from verse 6 onward. Verse 7 specifies the first angel's message. And it says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. We're all familiar with this. If, if uh, you know, anyone asks us what is our mission, we'd probably go to this path. Most Adventists would probably go to the three angels' message and say, this is the message we are to give to the world. Uh, in order to give the message, you must first understand it correctly, right? That's a, it's a pretty obvious prerequisite. Who is this message talking about? It's talking about someone, him, an individual, one individual, not many, obviously, because it says him, his judgment, him that made heaven and earth. He's the creator. And I think we already covered a fair bit of, uh, of evidence as to who this creator is. We saw that all things were made... Uh, or God, sorry, God made all things through His Son, Jesus Christ, or by His Son, Jesus Christ. So who would this message then be referring to? It's none other than the Father. He is the one that is to be worshipped correctly. It's because of the false worship and the confused worship that has uh, come about among even the Christian world that God sends these three angels' messages and they have to do with worship. That's the core, the heart of the three angels' messages. The first angel talks about worship. Uh, what's the second angel say? Babylon has fallen, right? And then the third angel talks about? Worship. worship of the beast and his image if you receive the mark and what will happen. So it's, worship. it's all about worship. Who are you going to worship? One or the other? And so it's a very serious matter to know and understand who it is that we worship. <clears throat> we saw what Jesus said about worship when we're talking a little bit about uh, the commandments as well. The maker of heaven and earth is the Father, one God, one person. And I, I always want to emphasize person because many people, when you say one God, they can agree to that, but in their mind they say, yeah, but there are three persons and there's one God. So one God, one person. This is what this message is referring to, just to be clear. Uh, here, is, uh, here are a few uh, texts that help confirm the Acts 4.24. This is the disciples praying. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. They are praying. Who are they praying to? To the Father, as Jesus taught them, right? Notice what verse 27 says. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with all the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So they're praying, they're praying to the Father, and they recognize and understand that He is the Lord of, or sorry, that He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What does that wording remind you of? Sabbath, Sabbath commandment, right? So this is what the apostles understood. It is God the Father. And of course they're saying, you know, they, they rebelled against your your child Jesus. So this, this just confirms for us who they're talking about. They understood that the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Ten Commandments, is none other than God the Father, one individual person. And uh, according to the words of the scribe, none other but He. And Jesus told him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Of course, they'd learned this truth from the lips of Christ Himself. And obviously from scriptures, but Christ was with them for for three years when he was on earth. Luke 10, 21, this is one of the things they would have heard from Christ. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So according to Jesus here, we see also that 
the Father is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the maker and Lord of heaven and earth. And we saw how he made all these things. Uh, obviously, uh, I mentioned it as well. That's why Jesus taught his disciples when they pray, they are to pray to the Father. And, and that's how we are to pray as well. And so your understanding of who God is is going to affect your worship and your prayer. There is no question about it. There is absolutely no question about it. How you pray, who you pray to, and who you direct your prayer to, and your worship will be affected by your view of God. Either it's going to one person ultimately, or to three. Now that makes a very big difference. Especially when the issue in the last days we know is over worship, then that's a really, really serious, serious tragedy if we have confusion over worship. The very purpose of the three angels' messages is to correct worship, is to bring or restore true worship to the true God. And so to give that message, you need to have the correct understanding. And so the Trinity basically is a contradiction to the three angels' messages. If, if the first, you can't get past the first one, if you forget about getting the other two right. You know, the other two are based on the first one. As a matter of fact, the other two angels don't tell you to do anything. If you think about it. The only part of the three angels' messages that actually gives you some kind of instruction or requirement or tells you to do something is in the first angel. The other two angels are basically warnings to those who do not heed what the first angel says. They're only warnings. The second angel says Babylon is falling. You don't have to do anything. It's just an announcement. The third angel says also, it's a warning. If you worship the beast and Zim, that's what's going to happen. It doesn't actually tell you to do anything. Only the first angel tells you to do something. That's the... That's the primary part of the message that sets up the others they, they are based on that and so the, the trinity distorts the identity of the god that is mentioned in the first angel's message that's a really good exercise to ask people you know who is the first angel's message talking about it's interesting that sometimes you get different answers from adventists that tells you there's a problem straight away <laughs> how are we meant to give the message of the three angels messages if we don't understand who that's about and uh, Having a correct understanding of who God is, of course, is, is the very heart and core of the three angels' messages. Uh, we go into detail a lot more in other, as in other messages, so I'm not going to spend too much detail. We're just looking at the highlights of each particular uh, pillar or landmark truth. The next one is the sanctuary. And uh, while well, we'll read this verse, since it's up there, everybody's going to read it. Anyway, let's read it, then we'll talk about it. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, when we talk about the sanctuary doctrine or the sanctuary truth, something that's very dear to us, right? When we think of the sanctuary, what's the first thing you think of? What does it have to do with? Generally, the answer will be something along the lines of, oh, this is where you believe that there is a temple in heaven. And I've, I've sat through many discussions and even debates over, is there a temple in heaven? And how many uh, compartments or how many apartments and this is this big debates and and we think this is what comprises the sanctuary doctrine in that if you believe there is a building in heaven with two apartments then you believe in the sanctuary doctrine if you don't believe that you don't believe in the sanctuary doctrine which is to be honest a little shallow the sanctuary doctrine is not just about a building in heaven the whole point of the sanctuary is the ministration that happens there and the ministration that happens there is because the priests who is there? The mediator. That's, that's what that verse is telling us. And so the sanctuary doctrine is more than just, I believe there is a real temple in heaven, then you believe it, and I don't, then you're a denier of it and you're a heretic. That's, that's what it amounts to in a lot of people's minds. And so I, I think we need to go a little deeper than just that shallow surface aspect. So how does that relate with our view of God? Obviously, the ministration that happens in the sanctuary is what really matters. A building in heaven is really not very relevant to us, if we were to be honest and practical. Now, I'm not trying to deny it. Don't get me wrong. I fully believe it. But just believing that there is a building in heaven, that alone means nothing. It's what happens in that building. It's the priest and his ministry. That's what the effective part of the sanctuary doctrine. This is really the, the powerhouse of it. And so, this ministry of Christ... This heartbeat of the sanctuary, Christ being our high priest. What, had, what did Christ have to do to become our high priest? And how does that impact us here on earth? Because the sanctuary doctrine is not just a, uh, one of those doctrines that's just theoretical and, and far removed from us. 
It's not just a doctrine that exists light years away in heaven and we believe it and that's it. It has to have some relevance and some practical bearing on us here on earth. And this is where hopefully what we're talking about starts uh, coming into play. Notice what the scripture says about Christ. Hebrews 2, 16 to 18. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, that is becoming a human being like us. There was a reason why Christ had to become a man. One of the reasons that is mentioned in this particular context is this. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that, excuse me, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. One of the reasons why Christ took on humanity is so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. His humanity is actually what qualifies him to become our high priest. That's why he could not be our high priest before he took on humanity. And for 4,000 long years in heaven, the temple, the sanctuary in heaven, did not have a high priest representing humanity because Christ was not yet a man. It's when he came as a man and was tempted like us, he became a merciful and faithful high priest so that he can help us because he was tempted like us. And so after he went back to heaven, that's when his priesthood commenced. And that is why the Levitical priesthood came to an end. That's actually why God had instituted the Levitical priesthood as a type or as a prophecy pointing forward to what Christ would, to a greater degree, fulfill and accomplish. That's the, the Levitical priesthood was only a, you know, like a, an acted out prophecy. It wasn't real in the sense that it did not accomplish what Christ would accomplish. It was a type. Uh, you know, the Bible, we, we read the verse, I think, last night. The law made nothing perfect. That includes the Levitical priesthood and so on. So this is a necessary, very important component for the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, that he had to be a human being in order to represent us and be our high priest. And that's what he's doing right now. And so believing that, which a lot of most people generally believe, is good and well and important, the ministration of Christ. But here is then the next follow-up question. Does Christ carry out any ministration here on earth? while he is the minister in the sanctuary in heaven. Because like I said, our belief in the sanctuary is not just a far removed light years away. Up there there's a sanctuary, and yes, Christ is all the way up there. What about here? Does the high priest, our high priest, does Christ have a work of mediation as part of his high priestly ministry here on earth? And to answer that, we have to understand what the Bible tells us about the temple of God or the sanctuary. Too often, when we talk about the sanctuary, if I say the sanctuary, the first thing that will come in people's minds is the temple in heaven. But that's not the only sanctuary there is. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Knowing not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. We know these verses, right? What's another word for temple? Sanctuary. Would that be a fair enough uh, uh, you know, replacement word? The same thing. So God has a sanctuary not just in heaven, but where? On earth. We are his temple. Well, oh yeah, we all know that. You know, we think, yeah, we knew that one. But when we talk about the sanctuary doctrine, many times it's just what's up there in heaven. Is there a building or not? But we need to look at the, at the doctrine, at the truth, in a more wholesome way. Yes, there is a building in heaven. Yes, Christ is ministering in the most holy place. No question about it. But what about what's happening here on earth? Because that's where all of us are. We're down here. We're not up there. And the benefit from the ministry of Christ is not just a theoretical benefit where he does something long, long, uh, far, far away from us. It, that, that's, you know, it's not just theoretical. There is a real and practical relevance to us here today. Ephesians as well says the same thing. Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Peter talks about us as being lively stones, right? Living stones in this temple, in this sanctuary. 
So God has not just a temple in heaven, but has a temple, a sanctuary here on earth, where he desires to dwell. Now here is the question. Who is the minister of this sanctuary on earth? Who is the high priest of the earthly sanctuary? How many priests are there? Okay? We read the verse earlier. Is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's not just our mediator in the heavenly sanctuary. If you really want to believe the sanctuary truth, it's a wholesome truth. The, the same priest has to be ministering in whatever temple or temples there are. And we, we see that the temple on earth is his people. I think we all know that the Trinity doctrine teaches Christ is in heaven. Actually, some people believe Christ can only be in heaven and, and he is limited in that way. And so on earth, we have someone else who is helping Christ, someone called God the Holy Spirit. And he's the one who is, you know, among these people or even living in his people. That's a very serious problem, you know, because the Holy Spirit is not qualified to be a priest because the Holy Spirit never took on humanity. He is not tempted like we are. He is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And therefore, based on the verse we read in Hebrews, is not able to succor us when we are tempted. And that's what we need the most. What good is it if my high priest, who took on humanity, left me, went to heaven, and sends me someone else? Right? So when we look at the sanctuary doctrine that we believe, you know, it's, it's a lot more than just a building. It's, it's actually very practical. Who is your high priest? Who is ministering in the sanctuary on earth? It can only be the same priest. Only one priest is qualified to do that. That's Christ. And so Christ is doing a dual work. Or he's doing a work on two fronts. He's ministering in the sanctuary above in heaven, in the flesh, in, in, in his humanity. And he is still ministering in this temple on earth by his spirit, which is his very own Life, his very own presence, not someone else. And that is how he links both us and God together. One mediator. We don't have two mediators, only one. And when we talk about that, someone will say, well, hold on, brother. Romans 8 says different. Some people use Romans 8 to, to actually say, well, we have a different mediator here on earth. Let's read it. This is a passage. I think you might have heard that, but it's very relevant in this context. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. People say, see, here, here is the Spirit making intercession while Christ makes intercession in heaven. So we have two intercessors. That's what some people actually teach. Do we have two intercessors? That sounds very, very wrong. At the outset, it's how you define spirit that you arrive at, which meaning you arrive at will depend on how you define spirit right there. Many, most people, if you believe in the Trinity, you read spirit as someone other than the Father and the Son. And so, of course, you're going to come to a different conclusion. But if you understand that spirit is defined in Scripture as life, as mind, as breath. It's always belonging to someone. It is always a spirit that belongs to someone. You don't have independent spirits like that. Even angels that are called spirits, they are actual individuals. They are persons. We talk about evil spirits. You know, an evil spirit is a fallen angel. It's not some other entity. And so how we define spirit is very important. And it says here, this spirit helps our infirmities or our weaknesses we don't know how we should pray, but the Spirit helps us and it makes what? Intercession for us. Does it tell us where this intercession is made? Now, if you think of other Bible verses that we looked at, we looked at the one in Galatians where it says, God sends forth what? The Spirit of His Son where? Into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So this intercession happens in our hearts by the Spirit. And what it does, it, it, uh, it says, with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, many times when you're praying, the Spirit will touch your heart in a way and you will have certain thoughts and feelings and emotions that you want to express in prayer and there are no adequate words to do so. Have you ever experienced that? You know what I'm talking about? 
When that happens, that is the Spirit of the Lord working on your heart and interceding and drawing out these, these, these prayers with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's what's happening. You're responding to the Spirit of God. Sometimes there aren't really adequate words to express that. And then this is the beautiful thing. The rest of the verse goes on to say, And he that searcheth the hearts. Who's that? Who's the heart searcher? The Lord himself, Jesus. Let's be very specific because we're going to see that in a minute. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Or in other words, it knows what is the intent or the meaning of the Spirit. See, Christ is well aware of what your response is in response to his Spirit working on his heart. And that's what enables Christ, because he knows that, that's what enables him to make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He knows that because he is a human like us. His spirit in our hearts is, is touching us and drawing us and, and, and connecting us with him. And he knows exactly every feeling and response and emotion that we have. It's him who is doing this, not someone else. And this is what enables him to make intercession for us on the right hand of God. The same chapter actually tells us that he's the only one who's qualified to do that. Just a little, uh, a few verses later, Romans 8, 34. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Christ is making intercession for us because he knows exactly what we're going through. He knows exactly what we're experiencing. Not theoretically, because his spirit is in our hearts, in the heart of the believer. And he knows exactly what we need. And he alone can make that intercession for us. That passage, brothers and sisters, is not teaching us that there is another intercessor. It's teaching us about the heart work that Christ is doing. Even though he is in the temple in heaven. He is doing a work in this temple here on earth. Let me read you a statement from Spirit Prophecy in this uh, context as well. Zareb Ages 166. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit the minister of the church on earth. So just ask yourself a question. How many ministers are there according to this statement so far? Only one. Not two. And it goes on. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. While he delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence is still with his church. What's his energizing presence? His spirit. With his people. He is the minister of the church on earth, of the temple on earth. There, we don't have multiple priests. And so therefore, oh, there is another statement before, before we go on. Let, let me read this other statement because it comments on Romans 8. It says, we have only one channel of approach to God. Our prayers can come to him through one name only, that of the Lord Jesus, our advocate. His spirit must inspire our petitions. No strange fire was to be used in the censers that were waved before God in the sanctuary. So the Lord himself must kindle in our hearts the burning desire if our prayers are acceptable to him. The Holy Spirit within must make intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Isn't that clear? That's the Lord himself who does that. His spirit within. And he himself in person, physically, in heaven. And he makes that connection. And so, if you believe in the Trinity doctrine, to put it simply, you do not really believe in the biblical sanctuary doctrine. The two are totally incompatible. Because the Trinity doctrine gives you someone else, another intercessor besides Christ. If Christ is not the high priest of every temple there is, then you do not really believe in the biblical sanctuary doctrine. doesn't matter how many buildings you believe are in heaven. If your high priest in the earthly temple is different to the high priest that is alone qualified to do that work, then you have a very serious problem. You with me? Mm -hmm. And so it's amazing that the devil has managed to bring in this false notion about God and diffuse every single distinctive Adventist truth. Just take its effectiveness out. And we think we believe it, but there are all these problems that exist. That's what we're looking at a little bit uh, here. And so Christ is the only intercessor, he's the only mediator. He does that by his spirit, not someone else called God the Holy Spirit other than Christ. The next one in our list is uh, number six. The faith of Jesus. We saw that's what the statement said, you know, on the, 
on the banner that's unfurled by the angels, is, there is written the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus, what's that about? Uh, let's read John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, that's unto Christ, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? This is a really good question that Jesus was asked. I, I like this question because I really like the answer that's, that's given, which we're going to read in a minute. But if we were to summarize the gospel... Put simply, I know it can summarize in so many ways, in so many words, but put simply, it is God changing us and making us righteous who are unrighteous. Correct? That's the whole point of the gospel. It's to change us, to redeem us, to make us righteous. We're unrighteous, we're unholy. God wants to transform us, to save us. To do so, that's what the gospel is to, uh, is to accomplish, to make us righteous. And we understand that this righteousness... Uh, comes about not through any doing or earning on our part. It comes by faith. So that's what we refer to as righteousness by faith. So here is Jesus being asked this question by the people there. And uh, the, question, the point of the question is really simple. What, what do we need to do to please God? That's the, when it says, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What do we need to do? It will make God happy, that will make God approve of us, that will please God. That's the question. A very good question to ask Jesus, right? How can we fulfill God's will? Well, the answer, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. I think we all know this verse, but very, very profound answer. This is the work of of God, that you might believe on Him whom He hath sent. That's what pleases God. This is what God desires from us. So I want you to think about that. It is not God's work to keep the law. Right? According to the answer of Jesus. He didn't say, oh, keep the law. Right? He didn't say, or oh, keep the Sabbath. That's, that's an important one, you know, because we're Seventh-day Adventists. It's not to adhere to certain rules and regulations. It's not to have a particular set of doctrines or beliefs. That's not the work of God, according to Christ. It is not to have all these uh, great uh, vegetarian meals either, right? Or to have these uh, long dresses. And, and That's not the work of God. He didn't say that. Many times, this is in our minds, this is what we believe, the work of God, to please God, to, to make God happy and approve of us and accept us. We'll keep the law and the Sabbath and, 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 and all these things. Here Jesus is telling us what is pleasing to God, the work of God that God wants us to do so that He can approve of us is to believe on His Son. This is a very, very significant verse. It basically is summarizing for us the most important thing that there is. In other words, you may do all these things and the law and the Sabbath and so on and so forth, and you might miss out on the very work of God. You realize that? That's possible, right? So Jesus summarizes it perfectly here. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things are bad or not important. They have their place. But there is something that supersedes all of that. It is to believe on the Son. Without that, everything else is useless and meaningless. Because only the life of the Son is acceptable to God. That's the only righteous human life that exists in this world. No one else has manifested perfect righteousness like the life of Christ. The only human being that ever impressed God, the only human being that is totally approved of God is Jesus Christ. You have no hope of getting there. You have no hope of repeating what Christ accomplished. No, no one does. Your only hope is in having what Christ accomplished. That's why it says believing on the Son. Because when you believe on the Son, the Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power and authority. And other verses that we're going to look at as well. And so this is what righteousness by faith is about. When you believe the Son, you receive His righteous life by faith, not someone else's life. Let's look at a few verses. To that effect, Galatians 3.22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's the first thing that God is concerned with that we might receive by faith. The promise of the faith of the Son, or the life 
of the Son. Or the Son himself, that's what it is. You don't have the life without the Son. It's he that hath the Son hath life. That's what righteousness by faith is all about. That's the primary purpose and point of the gospel. It's given <clears throat> to those who do what? To those that believe, right? It's not given to those who keep the commandments. It doesn't say that. It's not given to those who keep every Sabbath faithfully and make sure they do all these. It's not what it says. They believe, that believe. Now, I'm not knocking these other things, but they cannot replace faith at all. And many times, you know, uh, indirectly, we kind of shuffle things around a little bit. We place a lot of importance on our obedience. But we need to remember that things come in a particular order. Faith is to produce that, of course. There's no question about that. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That righteousness of God exists only in one place. You know where? In the life of Christ. When Christ went to heaven as a man, the Bible tells us that God told him, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. God has never said that to any other human being. The righteousness of God is only perfectly revealed in one place in the life of the Son. If you want the righteousness of God, you have to have the life of the Son. That's what it comes down to. That's what the faith of Jesus is all about. Amen. And no one else will give you that. Whether it be human or divine. Because a lot of people say, well, the God, the Holy Spirit does that. He is a divine being. First of all, that is not established from the scripture at all. Second of all, the Holy Spirit did not live a righteous human life that pleased God. If it was a separate person from Christ. Only Christ did that. And so when you have this belief that tells you, well, Christ has gone to heaven and we have now someone else, then you don't have the life of the Son. If the Holy Spirit is a different person to Christ, then it is not the life of the Son. Then what have you got? By faith. You have someone else. You don't have, the, you don't have the righteous life of the Son. It's a very serious problem when it comes to righteousness by faith. It, can we see that? You with me? And so it's necessary and important to understand. That. That's why the devil has created a lot of these uh, diversions and false ideas. Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by... His life. What's another word we can put there? His spirit. Would that be correct? Yes. Because the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's what happens if Christ be in you. The body is dead, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's a holy, perfect, righteous, and eternal life. That's how you're saved. Because that life is eternal. So you have automatically eternal life. That life is righteous. That life is holy. It's called the holy Spirit or the holy life. But see, we, we are so accustomed to thinking a certain way. We say Holy Spirit, straight away we think, oh, that's someone else. Holy is just simply describes to you what kind of spirit it is. Just like there is an unclean spirit or an evil spirit. So that's what the point of the gospel is. Colossians 1.27 To whom God would make known what is the riches of the, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of? glory do we really believe that it's not it's not uh, Christ in you but if you really look at it closely it's not Christ who's really in you he sends someone else to represent him that that's that doesn't mean Christ is in you you know when Jesus said uh, to his disciples he's, he's going to send the comforter in the same passage uh, he says I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you he doesn't mean that he will send someone to represent him. He will come. He is that other comforter. So this righteous life of the Son is what alone can make us righteous. Jesus does that. We referred to this verse earlier. Because we are sons, Galatians 4, 6, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's the spirit of adoption. That's how we become sons and daughters of God. Think about it this way. We have the very life of His Son. 
And so God looks on us like his own children. He treats us like he treats his son. Because we have the life of his son. That's, that's what, when Christ accomplished salvation, this is what he desired of his father. At the end of his prayer there in, in John 17, he says, Father, I wish or I desire that all those that you've given me to be with me where I am. He wants us to be treated like he is. He went through all this trouble so that we can be like that. The only way that that happens on a real practical level is that we receive his life. And so his father becomes our father. That's why it says, crying, Abba, father. That's what the comforter really is. That's what the comforter is all about. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So when Christ is in you, you have that same law of the spirit of life. You have that life. That's what righteousness by faith is all about. We, uh, we kind of co covered that a little bit more in detail, but this is just a brief summary of what the practical aspects of the gospel are. Jesus came to live as a man so that he can continue to be our helper, our life. Not so that he could abandon us and send us someone else. So, righteousness by faith is distorted when you have a different view of the Spirit, which is what the Trinity sadly does. But I understand that a lot of people believe in the Trinity and they, they believe in righteousness by faith. Maybe they haven't thought it through, but the two are incompatible. If you really logically sit down and think it through, you will find there is a conflict. The two are totally incompatible. Last one is the second coming of Christ. We're Seventh-day Adventists, right? So the second coming is an important event. The Bible says, Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in, his glory, in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. This is another pillar that we have. This is a very distinctive and important truth. Uh, truth. And all these other truths are designed to lead and prepare us for that. Now when Christ comes a second time, I'm not sure if you... Maybe you thought about this. Again, this is another common question that comes up. Uh, who is going to come in the second coming? Right? You ever thought about that? Is it going to be Christ? Or is it going to be Christ and the Father? Or is it going to be Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit? Who is going to come in the second coming? You know the angels are coming. We're planning to be there by God's grace. But who is going to come? You, you ever wondered about that? I guess the answer, again, depends on what you believe about God, right? You know, is the Trinity coming or, or is the Son coming? Many times it's referred to as the second coming of Christ. Jesus basically says here he comes, uh, he doesn't say that he comes with his Father. He says he comes in the glory of his Father and all the holy angels with him. And uh, in another place, I don't have it here, but we know the verses. Jesus tells his disciples what? Uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, right? You know that passage? And then he goes, he says, he's going to prepare a place for us. And this is, these are the words he uses. In my father's house are many mansions. What is his father's house? When he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he says, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going to go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you, then I'm going to come back and take you and receive you so that you might be where I am. Right? You know the passage? John 14. What is he talking about when he says, in my father's house are many mansions? What's his father's house? Heaven, yes, for correct, heaven. He's talking about heaven. Not that hard, huh? It's getting late, I know. Heaven, that's what he's talking about, brothers and sisters, right? You know what I'm talking about or not? It sounds strange, nobody's answering. It's heaven. It's not a trick question. Sorry, it's not a trick question. It's too, it's too simple, sorry. Yeah, it's better to answer and get it wrong than to not answer, huh? No, it is heaven. So, but the point I'm trying to make is this. According to Jesus, heaven belongs to someone. Who's the owner of heaven? One person. It's his father's home. In his father's home is, are many mansions. He's going to go and prepare for us a place. It's not his home. Well, he lives there, but it doesn't belong to him. He's the son of the father. It's his father's home. And the picture that is really beautiful, that the point I'm trying to make here, and sorry, I wasn't meaning to trick anyone. But the, the, the point is... Uh, Christ is going to come and to take us to his father's home. Very much like what would happen in, in a Jewish wedding. When, when, the, when the groom goes to collect his bride, he brings her to his father's home. 
And usually what happens is uh, the father or the parents would be waiting to welcome the bride. That's the image, that's the picture there. And so that's exactly what happens. The owner of heaven, the father, will be waiting for us when Christ brings us back. And so Christ comes in his glory and in the glory of the father with all the angels. But the father is not going to be coming. He's waiting in his house for us to come so they can, he can give us <clears throat> sorry so he can give us the royal welcome to his house we're going to look at that in a minute but before we go there let's read Colossians 3 4 this has been read a few times but again it's a beautiful verse when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory this is the only preparation that you need to be ready for the second coming if Christ is your life if Christ is your life, when He appears, you will appear with Him in glory. If He's not your life, you will not appear with Him in glory. It doesn't say, if you understand these doctrines, it doesn't say if you're a baptized member of this particular denomination, it doesn't say if you've kept the commandments all your life, it doesn't say anything like that. The only preparation that you need to be ready for the second coming is to have Christ be your life now. So when He comes you're going to appear with Him in glory. That's what it says, right? And of course, when Christ is your life now, what He lived, His righteous life, will manifest in your life. So I'm not saying you're going to be a disobedient rebel to go do whatever you want and, and you know, break all the commandments and, and you'll be fine. That's not what I'm trying to say. The, the, the key component for preparation is not in doctrine, is not in obedience, is not in trying to do all these things, is having the life of Christ. If you have the life of Christ, everything is set. Everything is in its place. Because that righteous life that he had was witnessed to by the law and the prophets. It's in harmony with the law and the prophets. It's not going to be out of harmony with that. But having the life is the key component. Very, very beautiful and very encouraging verse. Let me read the statement to you. I, I like this statement because it, it gives this beautiful picture. And it's a beautiful one to close with. Uh, Bible Commentary, uh, Volume 7, page 950. We are saved because God loves the purchase of the blood of Christ. And not only will He pardon the repentant sinner, not only will He permit him to enter heaven, but He, the Father of mercies, will wait at the very gates of heaven to welcome us, to give us an abundant entrance to the mansions of the blessed. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Here is Christ, you know, coming to take us home with all the angels and this big crowd of people and angels all going back to heaven and at the gate of heaven who's standing waiting to welcome us home the father and to be there you need to have Christ be your life that's 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 the only preparation that's what Christ will recognize and so Christ is the one who comes to take us home and uh, sadly I guess uh, the, the the Trinity doctrine distorts this picture a little bit you, you really don't know who's coming or who's going or who's where okay we figured out the father and the son what about the holy spirit well if, if you if you have a correct understanding of the spirit you're not going to even ask that question that's why in the book of revelation uh, in heaven when john sees the redeemed in heaven it says you know they serve him that sits on the throne and the lamb that's the father and the son it doesn't talk about the spirit not because there is no spirit but because the Spirit is not someone else other than the Father and the Son. And so this is what the second coming is about as well. So the pillars of our faith that we looked at, every single one of them, we find that the, the Trinity really is totally incompatible with all of them. The Trinity is the destruction of the Advent message and the Advent faith. You realize that? It's a high claim to make, but I'm making it after we went to all the details to look at why we're saying what we're saying. It is the antithesis. It is the total nullifying and destruction of the distinctive truths of Adventism. Which is why the devil brought it right into our church. And now it's a fundamental belief. And if you speak against it, you might get kicked out and called a heretic and be deprived of your membership which some people equate with depriving you of salvation, essentially. We are really in the last days, brothers and sisters. 
It's a very, very serious matter. We looked at all of them. Ten Commandments, Sabbath, State of the Dead, Three Angels' Messages, Heavenly Sanctuary, Faith of Jesus, and the Second Coming. These are the distinctive truths that we hold dear. So really, it comes down to this. These two are incompatible. They are contrary to each other. You can either believe in the Trinity, or you can either believe in the Advent message. You can't have it both ways. And you're free to choose. You can believe the one or the other. If you hold both, they are incompatible, as we saw. It, it, let me tell you something. <laughs> we will never finish the work believing in the Trinity as a people. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Every single distinctive truth that we have is destroyed. Practically, on a practical level, as we have seen. So either we will have, as a, and I'm talking we as, as, a, uh, as Adventists, in all our, you know, the whole, everyone who subscribes to, to any Advent, in the church, out of the church, beside the church, whatever it might be, uh, all of us as those who profess to believe in the Advent message, we cannot finish the work with this in our midst. Either we will have to change, or God is going to bring it to the attention of people to realize where the problem exists and they will put away the false gods and stand on the truth that God established this movement on. Then he can use people like that to finish the work. But as it stands now, we have a very, very serious problem. Maybe that's why we're still here, huh? That's one of the best ways to delay the finishing of the work. That's why the devil has been very busy bringing this in. And as we saw very early on in the verse we read in Peter, men come in privily among us who deny the only Lord God who brought us out. That's what's happened by planting the banner of the God of Rome in our midst. So I hope that uh, you can see the interconnectedness of, of these different truths, how they all relate to our view and our concept and our understanding of God. And hopefully next time someone asks you why this is important or what this has to do with the end times and, and the present truth message that we have, maybe you can give them something to think about. Because it's a very, very serious matter, brothers and sisters. The two do not go together whatsoever. All right, we'll leave it there. We'll close with a word of prayer.